Tonight on The Readout. He said more people voted in Philadelphia than there were voters. And that was absolute rubbish. And I said something to the effect of, sir, we've done dozens of investigations, hundreds of interviews. The major allegations are not supported by the evidence developed. Lie, cheat, and steal. Testimony today at the second January 6th hearing reveals that Trump knew he lost, but tried to steal the election anyway, while cheating his MAGA supporters out of their hard-earned money. Plus, some are calling the gun reform framework a good first step. That suggests more is coming. Color me skeptical. We'll talk about all of that and more with Karine Jean-Pierre in her first live primetime interview since she made history, becoming the new White House press secretary. But we begin with day two of public hearings by the House January 6th committee. Today, showing how Donald Trump deliberately launched the big lie to convince his own voters that he won an election he lost using claims of non-existent fraud and then seeking to corrupt the Justice Department, his own campaign team, his donors, and our court system in an effort to cling to power. And if you think he cooked up that plan after the election as a Hail Mary because he simply couldn't accept defeat, understand that Donald Trump went into the election already planning to lie about the outcome, having laid the groundwork for months. Mail ballots are a very dangerous thing for this country because they're cheaters. When you do uh, all mail-in voting ballots, you're asking for fraud. The only way we're going to lose this election is if the election is rigged. Remember that. I've been complaining very strongly about the ballots, and the ballots are a disaster. Get rid of the ballots, and you'll have a very trans we'll have a very peaceful. There won't be a transfer, frankly. There'll be a continuation. This is going to be a fraud like you've never seen. And then on election night, despite being told by numerous advisors, all diehard Republicans, whose testimony we heard, that it was too early to declare victory since votes were still being counted and the predicted outcome, frankly, didn't look favorable for him, Trump did it anyway, falsely claiming that the election was stolen. Today, we learned more about who was advising him to make that claim from former campaign advisor Jason Miller, including this revelation about that individual's condition at the time. Mayor was definitely intoxicated, but I do not um, know that his level of talk intoxication when he spoke uh, with the president, for example. Effectively, Mayor Giuliani was saying, we want it. They're stealing it from us. Where'd all the votes come from? We need to go say that we won. And essentially to anyone who didn't agree with that position was being weak. An attorney for Rudy Giuliani denied he was drinking that night, but we heard Giuliani on tape telling the committee he did speak to the former president several times on election night and in the days that followed. The increasingly farcical claims by Rudy and Trump lawyer Sidney Powell took center stage in the former president's mind, despite being told the truth by basically everybody else, from his numbers guys to his campaign manager Bill Stepien and his own White House lawyers. I didn't mind being categorized. There were two groups of him. We called them kind of my team and Rudy's team. I, I didn't mind being characterized as being part of Team Normal, as, as reporters, you know, kind of started to do around that point in time. I didn't think what was happening was necessarily honest or professional at that point in time. So what they were proposing, I thought was nuts. And then the theory was also completely nuts. Even his extravagantly loyal attorney general, William Barr, told Trump that there was no fraud, specifically adding that false claims about Dominion voting systems, which have since gotten Giuliani and Powell sued, were ludicrous. I told him that the stuff that his people were shoveling out to the public were bull was bull****. I mean, that the claims of fraud were bull****. I thought, boy, if he really believes this stuff, he has, you know lost contact with, uh, with uh, he, he's become detached from reality, if he really believes this stuff. When I went into this and would, you know, tell him how crazy some of these allegations were, there was never, there was never an indication of interest in what the actual facts were. In fact, Trump's claims in the immediate aftermath of the election were so bizarre. Former Fox News political editor Chris Steyerwall put it this way. After the election, as of November 7th, 
In your judgment, what were the chances of President Trump winning the election? After that point? Yes. None. The idea that through any normal process in any of these states, remember, he had to do it thrice, right? He needed three of these states to change. And in order to do that, I mean, you're at, you're at uh, an infant, you're better off to play the Powerball. Despite knowing full well that his claims were a lie, Trump still began marketing the snake oil of a stolen election, starting from his first post-election interview, an interview Bill Barr referenced in his testimony. Everybody said, this is over. I'm telling you, at 10 o'clock, everybody thought it was over. And then the, pho right. then the phony mail-in started coming in, Maria. But just so you understand, I got 74 million votes. It was over. And then mail-in started yes. happening. Glitches started happening. This election was rigged. This election is a total fraud. And after months of those lies, by January 6th, the train had left the station. And millions of Trump supporters had been infected by the big lie, with a mob primed and ready to march on the Capitol. 400,000 people that weren't even registered voted. 430,000 votes disappeared from President Trump's tally. And you can't stand there and tell me that it worked. I don't want to tell you that what we're doing is right. But if the election's being stolen, what is it going to take? Joining me now is Yemi Sindor, anchor and moderator of Washington Week on PBS and an MSNBC Washington correspondent. Jill Weinbanks, former assistant Watergate special prosecutor and an MSNBC legal analyst. And Kurt Mardella, advisor to the DNC and the DCCC. Thank you all for being here, Yamish. I want to start with you. Um, you know, we did hear today uh, at least that Merrick Garland has stated that his prosecutors are watching. They are paying attention to what's going on. Uh, my question is, how much of Capitol Hill, particularly Capitol Hill Republicans, are paying attention to this? We know Fox News actually did carry this today, and we know that's what plays in their TVs, in their offices. Um, if significant numbers of Republicans were watching, what's been the reaction? Well, from my conversations with Republicans today, people are watching. Um, this was really a black box being opened into the White House with, re with people really hearing from the people that were closest to President Trump who were warning him that his lie could not metastasize and then watching it metastasize. And you also heard from people this shrinking inner circle that basically said, I can no longer be part of this. So I was texting with one Trump aide in particular who had literally traveled to different states trying to convince people that the election had been rigged. Today he told me um, that the that this really looked like President Trump was, quote, extremely culpable. And also it made him seem as though he's someone who is now chasing a fool's dream, that anybody who's going down this road with President Trump is continuing to really just believe in things that are not going to be happen at all and that it's actually pretty dangerous. I also want to note really quickly that this was also a fundraising aspect of this. President Trump has become a fundraising giant. So a lot of the Republicans I talked to pointed out that this is still politically viable for President Trump and the people who are sticking with him to, to support this lie. That being said, there are a lot of lies, but I don't know if that there are going to be a lot of minds change, Joy. Of course, because they're also using it as, a, as an excuse to pass restrictive voting laws. The big lie has been helpful for all Republicans up and down uh, the aisle. Um, or up and down the, 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 the ballot. Uh, but Jill Weinbanks, the other thing, and I think that's very important to note here, and we, we, we sort of got into that a little bit in the open, is that it's not as if Trump suddenly woke up after the November 3rd election and started to believe the big lie. He was already setting up to do the big lie, and in fact, it's his history, right? It's what he does. He says that any election where he doesn't like the outcome is stolen. He claimed that, you know, it was undocumented immigrants who elected Barack Obama. That wasn't real. Um, with Hillary Clinton, he was per already setting up to say that this election was going to be stolen. He even said that the election uh, in Iowa, when he lost to Ted Cruz, was stolen. He said, Ted Cruz, that was, that was stolen. That was fraud. So it, it, it is a pattern. So there's no way that any Republican or anybody, other than, I guess, his voters, could say that this was something new, right? You cannot say it's something new. And I think what was shown today was very compelling evidence that proves that he knew that it was a big lie, he knew the truth, and he can't use his lack of knowledge as a defense in this case. The jury, if there were a criminal case, would be instructed that willful ignorance of the facts is not a defense. And especially when the only person or persons who were giving him the information that it was okay, that he hadn't lost, was an inebriated Rudy Giuliani and Kraken lawyer, Sidney Powell, whereas everybody else from his campaign, 
his attorney general, all of the people that were surrounding him who had a reason to be advising him, who were actual employees, all said, you lost and there is no fraud. So it's not a defense. And that's very important what they did today. And, and you know, Kurt, you know, listen, Donald Trump was not listening to the people who were tippling on the ripple, allegedly, because he had no choice and he was desperate. He was doing it because he wanted to, right? I mean, I mean, you, you go through, let's go to Bill Stepien. Because I think this was his, his testimony to me was very important because he came into the campaign when they were already worried they were going to lose. They already had problems. He wasn't the original campaign manager. Here's what he said today. I inherited a campaign that was, the day I was hired was, I believe, President Trump's low point in the 2020 daily average polling against uh, President Biden. It was, uh, it was a campaign at a low point in the polls. Um, it was um, structurally and fiscally deficient. Um, you know, I, you know, there was uh, a great deal wrong with the campaign in, in, in both of those, um, in, in both of those areas. Most of my time was spent fixing the things that could be fixed. And by the way, this is also the same campaign manager, Kurt, and you and I both are very familiar with campaigns, who told me it would be a bad idea to downplay and to get his voters to hate mail-in balloting, because usually mail-in balloting is good for Republicans. So he sort of <laughs> dug his own grave by doing that. Your thoughts uh, on the way that this played out today and what we learned? Well, I think that the key headline here is that the big lie was nothing but exaggerated clickbait nonsense designed to drive up profit and donations for Donald Trump to grifting his own supporters. Uh, you know, the, the last thing that we saw in this hearing today when uh, uh, Zoe Lofgren articulated what the committee had found in terms of where the money went that they raised, $250 million, and that none of it went to any kind of election defense fund or any type of voter fraud investigative unit, it tells us that the motive of all of this from day one, the minute that the polls closed in November of 2020, was making money from his supporters, was grifting the diehard Trumpers the same way that Steve Bannon grifted his supporters through that build the wall fund that was never used for anything like that, uh, that was ultimately found to be a crime. Uh, that's what this was all about, that Donald Trump profited from the big lie, that everything that we saw from listening to drunk Giuliani to ignoring all of his uh, advisors, to ignoring the attorney general, um, was all about grifting, keeping the grift going forward. And uh, you know, it's, it's mind-numbing to me, Joy, that even now, all this time removed from the election, there are still Republicans who are bending over backwards to try to get this guy's support, following his lead, keeping him at the top of the Republican Party, despite all the things that we know. Watch these proceedings for any Republicans out that still follows this guy. Uh, you're, you're following drunk Rudy at the same time. Just keep that in mind. Well, and including, uh, Bill, let's not leave out Bill Barr. I have to say this. I mean, I'll, I'll go to you on this, Joe. Bill, William Barr is attempting to sort of do a great laundry deal here. He did testify under oath. That's good. And he's telling the truth. And then he told Trump the truth. He did an AP interview in which he said, no, I, I told him that this was all, hunk bo uh, you know, you know it, was, it was crazy. It was, it's not true. It was crazy stuff. It was BS. This is what he was saying before the election about mail-in balloting. The mailing out universally of ballots. What I've said is that opens the floodgate to potential fraud and coercion. We're a very closely divided country here. And if people have to have confidence in the results of the election and the legitimacy of the government, and people trying to change the rules to this, to this methodology, which as a matter of logic is very open to fraud and coercion. You know, liberals project, you know, the president is going to stay in office and right. seize power Hitler and all that. Fascism. I've never heard of that crap. Right. I mean, I'm the attorney general. This is the, oh, the irony, Jill. I mean, this is the guy who lied about the Mueller report, uh, who did a fake investigation that's still actually going on about the origins of the Russiagate investigation, attack voting by mail, called COVID lockdowns the greatest intrusion on civil liberties in American history, promoted the theory of the deep state. I could go on, but we don't have the time. Jill Weinbanks, what do you make of the idea that he then becomes the number one witness so far as used by the committee against his, his former boss, Donald Trump. I'm very happy that he's telling the truth now. I think he owed it to the country to tell the truth when it mattered, yeah. when there was an impeachment going on, when something could have been done that would have barred 
Donald Trump from ever running for office again. So while I applaud his doing it now, I can't applaud him or hold him to any high standard because he failed and he didn't do his duty as a public servant. He was obligated to do that. So better late than never, I guess. But um, it's, and again, it would have been even more powerful if he had testified in person. I would like to see more live testimony because I know from uh, the Watergate trial that a live witness just has much more impact on a jury yeah. than recordings. Even the recordings of the president saying committing crimes yeah. on tape is not as effective as hearing a witness say, this is what I heard, this is what I did. Yeah. So we need more of that. And, and very quickly, Yamish, I mean, this was Republicans against Republicans. They can't, no one on Capitol Hill could possibly be saying this was partisan attacks on Trump, right? Well, of course, Kevin McCarthy is saying that. But at the end of the day, you have a bipartisan group of lawmakers saying that President Trump did something that no other U.S. president in history has done, and that is to try to subvert the Constitution and stay in power unlawfully. And I have to also note that President Trump put out this 12-page statement tonight mm. talking about the fact that this hearing is made up and this, this committee is unfair. That tells you that he's watching. That tells you that he is sitting and stewing because he realizes that the people that were closest to him are now on live TV with millions of people watching watching, saying that he was lying and that they told him he was lying, and that, in fact, he decided to listen to a drunk Rudy Giuliani over people who had been doing this for decades and were looking at the data. Where do you put that on? Truth Social? Uh, Kurt Bardella, last note here, it, it, it wasn't, today it wasn't bipartisan, it was Republicans. These are Republicans, hardcore MAGA. Uh, Bill Stepien is right now working to unseat Liz Cheney when he's off paternity leave. Really quick, last thought. From day one, the number one witness, the star of these proceedings, were always going to be the Republicans who testified, right. Republicans who gave depositions, Republicans in their own words. And that's just the bottom line. There's no Democrats involved. This was a Republican operation. Um, Yamiche Alcindor, Jill Wine-Banks, Kurt Bardella, thank you all very much. Up next on The Readout, the big lie was also the big grift. How much money do you think Trump conned out of his supporters, as uh, Kurt mentioned, for an election defense fund that never even existed? I will tell you. And Karine Jean-Pierre is the first black woman and the first openly gay woman to serve as White House press secretary. And there's another first tonight. Her first live primetime interview since getting that important position. And it is right here with me on The Readout. Stay with us.